scripture reading today is in Luke 11, 29 through 33. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given. It expects the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a, <coughs> was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will be the Son of Man be to the generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the end of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and how something great, greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with the generation and condemn it, for they repented at the pre <coughs> preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. So be it. Morning. Can you hear me? The men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment of this generation. Think about that. Jesus Christ came and his people denied who he was. But Jonah, you should have read that last week, went and gave this little bitty sermon, didn't mention God or anything else, and the people repented. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, we know that it's alive and living. We know that it's profitable. Help us to read your words, apply them to our hearts, to teach, us, teach them to our children, to go out to this world and be a light, not to hide that light, but to let it shine brightly. And Lord, we pray for your spirit to guide us, to equip us, to carry us through this world so that we are more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't noticed in your reading, and hopefully you've been reading along, um, we're getting into more books. Right now you're reading some of Psalms, you're reading 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, you're reading, you read Jonah, this week you got, and you had Isaiah, this week you got Isaiah, and who down here? A Micah and Hosea will be coming up this week. Amos was last week. That's a lot. So I printed off sheets there for you to come grab. If I stuff bulletins and find them laying all over, I'm like, why'd I stuff them? <laughs> so I made copies up here, and I'll let you go out of your way to come get them if you want them. Also, remember that you can go on the Internet, Bible Project, and just put the book that you're wanting to see and do it. I highly stress that you get into Isaiah because it is very helpful, and there's so much there. But even on the little things, there's so much to, to understand there, and this is a good, good starting point. If you also notice up here, there are some prayer journals. If you men didn't get them, get them, and ladies, help yourself also, because they're not going to do any good sitting here. You also see a couple of plaques that Michaela's made. If you weren't here before, I mentioned that when we get to heaven, Jesus says that he will bring his reward with him when he comes. There is judgment. There is reward. There is separating of sheep versus goats. I am not going to be satisfied myself, and I hope that you're not just getting to heaven because that's not what God created me for. He created me to bring him glory. When you read that parable about the money given, 10 bags of gold or minus, however you read it in your Bible, you know, the first guy got 10, second guy got 5, third guy got 1. They were given accordingly to while God decided to give them. But then the ten made ten more. The five made five more. The one, we know, we know about him. We don't want to be that guy at all. But I want to be the ten even. God, I want him to give me an abundance, just like the rich man who wanted to build bigger barns. I don't want physical things. 
but I want more of his spirit so that I can be a light to that world, so that I can hear both of those two heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. But the one with ten, he got the extra. Not the one with five, he did the same thing as the other one again. But the one with ten got the extra. So Michaela and Jacob are making these plaques for you guys who that are reading along. And we're not going to give them out today because there's several people missing that will get one. So that gives the rest of you who aren't reading along a chance to catch up even. You've got another week. You've got mercy and grace. But see, I don't want you to live a life and not hear that, well done, my good and faithful servant. I wouldn't be shepherding you if I didn't tell you that. If I didn't tell you that, that God created you and designed you and he wants you to live a life of worth. So I entitled this message, Who Will I Send? That goes along with that. And we're getting into these minor prophets. The only thing minor about it is their book is not as long. <laughs> their message is still the message that God gives them. Okay? And then we got Isaiah. He's major. He's 63 chapters, maybe 66 chapters. I can't remember. But who will I send? There's a thing called the Great Suggestion, right? Great Commission. Okay, isn't that better? It's not a suggestion. You are commissioned by God, by Jesus Christ, to be his hands and feet to this world. If you're not fulfilling your commission, then you're directly disobeying the whole reason that Jesus Christ came to this earth. And the men of Nineveh will stand up and shout in judgment against you. Think about that scripture. Because you have been commissioned. You have the light of the world. Why in the world would you hide it? But you will dis should display it brightly for the world to see. Let me give you a history lesson if you're not following along or you're confused. Because it gets confusing bouncing back and forth. And you, you, if you don't watch it, you'll get confused on, is this the southern kingdom? And why is the northern kingdom called Israel if they're not really Israel? And, and now we're talking about this kingdom over here. It gets kind of confusing. Israel is by name the northern kingdom, but they're not following the ways of God. They have a false place of worship set up, false prophets, uh, false uh, teachings, everything false, but yet they still carry the name of Israel. And if you read through, you'll see bad king after bad king after bad king, but then you'll see a good king here and there. And you see Judah, you'll see that there are several good kings because they followed in the footsteps of their fathers. They followed in the footsteps of David. There's bad kings too. And you'll see God blessing and cursing. You'll see rain fall down on the good and the, and the evil, correct? That's just the way life is. But he's called you to be a light to this world. So 600 years before Christ, roughly, the Babylonian Empire came into existence. They conquered Assyria in 612 and destroyed their capital called Nineveh, that place where Jonah went. A place that's been around ever since the flood, and we see it being a place of sinful rebellion against God. If you can imagine something that you think is just, ah, oh, that's terrible, then it went on at Nineveh. But yet God wanted to spare them. Why? Because as Jesus teaches, he teaches us to love even our enemies because we are his enemies. We've sinned against him. But because Jesus Christ died for us, we can have mercy not get what we deserve, and we can have grace so much more than what we ever deserve. I'll say it again with my analogy. Mercy is when that cop stops you for a speeding ticket and doesn't give you one. Whew, that's mercy. <laughs> but grace is he gives you the key to his car, he gives you the key to your house, all the money he has in his wallet, and says, here you go. What? And that's what God does when he makes you children of the Most High. He not only gives you not the punishment that you deserve because the wages of sin is death, but instead he gives the, you the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Babylon, going back to history, Babylon sucks up Assyria. We have a, the mighty arm of Assyria first. And if we're thinking about this, we read all this prophecy about Babylonia, uh, Babylon and, and Assyria and everything, and Cyrus and all this. Well, Zephaniah, if we back up to around 654 to 663, so we backed up 30 years roughly. Here's what he says in Zephaniah 2.13. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly destroy, desolate and dry as a desert, desert. Now, if you didn't realize that, that was spoken 30 years before it happened. <laughs> it's because God is beyond space and time. 
He is the one who divinely brings about everything according to his will and purpose. All right, let's go back even further to the prophet Nahum. In Nahum 3, chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, it says, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show you the nations, show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort her? Now, if you are back, and we're born when we're born by the grace of God again, to be his hands and feet in this generation, where you're at, you might not know where your calling is, but wherever you're at today is where God has called you at to be today, and you're called to be a light today. But if you were back in the early 1800s, you would have never heard of Nineveh. It would have been one of those stories. You'd have heard about it from the Bible, but we had no record of it because they had been long destroyed. No city there to, to bear that name at that time. But then archaeologists came in and they upheaved where Nineveh was. These Bible stories that we read in here, like that crazy one about the giant fish. But God was sending his prophet to Nineveh to show them mercy. But in the 1800s, Nineveh was found, and we have records of that. And guess what we found out there from their uh, cuneiform what did they use for writing? Yeah, cuneiform. I was thinking it was hieroglyphics. Cuneiform. We found a symbol, the name of the city. Nina was the name of the city in Akkadian. It means fish in the house. <laughs> That's so funny. Because the fish spit up Jonah. He came into the house and said, repent. Well, he didn't even say repent. He said, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's what he said. Where's God in that? Where's repent in that? Nothing. He just came in and announced judgment. Didn't say where it's coming from, anything else, but there was a divine message there. So don't say you don't have the words to say to your neighbor or friend. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say, and you don't know. You might come over and just say, man, it's a lovely day today. And God uses that to break down walls. You have no idea, but don't deny the Holy Spirit calling you to be a light. So let's get back to our history lesson. Going back further in time to 701 B.C., the southern kingdom fell into Assyrian control. Going back further, 722, the northern kingdom of Israel. And these things were all foretold before they happened. Going back even further to 760 B.C., that is when God called this prophet named Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. Amazing how this is all in there from the different books of the Bible, written at different times by different people, and they tell God's plan perfectly. And let me add to this. Jesus Christ will return, and he will have his reward with him for those who are faithful. It's a fact. God is beyond all space and time, and every word that you read in the Bible is true and profitable for you. So let's go back even further than that, though, back before the book of Jonah. And let's go back to 2 Kings. You should have read that this year. And we're roughly between the time, because we know it because of the king's reign, Jeroboam II. He didn't go by Jeroboam II, but we call him the second so you don't confuse him with the Jeroboam that was back a couple hundred years before that. In the 15th, century, 15th year of Amaziah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now we've got a representation of the years. That puts us, like I said, between 782 and 823. That's before 760 because we count down. It's before, before Jonah goes to Nineveh. Only place in the Old Testament that we have a mention of Jonah before that. Okay? In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jeho Jehoash, king of Israel, <sighs> became king of Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was one who, re he was one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea. Well, wait a minute, he's a bad king. Why did God bless him? Just what God does for his purpose and his glory, right? Okay. In accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through who? His servant Jonah, son of Amidi. Now, maybe that's not the same Jonah, but if it's the time frame 
and his daddy is named the same as his daddy is in the book of Jonah. So it's the Jonah that we know. Okay? The prophet from Gath Hefer. The Lord had been, seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. But didn't they deserve what they got? They turned their back against the Lord. But God still is merciful. How? Oh, at just the right time, Christ came to this world. Verse 27, And since the Lord had not, had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash. As for the, that's Jeroboam II, just to remind you. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did, all his military achievements, including how he recovered Israel from Damascus and Hamath. Really? This bad king got all this accredited to his name? Because God does what God wants to do. Okay? Which had belonged to Judah, are they, are they not written in the book of annuals of the king of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his ancestors, the king of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. So when you're reading all that, you think you're just reading this liturgy, but think about it. Think about how God is working even through a rebellious people to bring about a new people called by a new name, Christians who are like Christ, who follow after the way, the truth, and the life, who live as children of light. Is that who you are? It's who we profess to be by being here today. Are you doing that in the world? Are you bringing the light to the dark world? Maybe you think you are because there's blessings on you, but here there was no reason for Israel or the king to get the blessings of God. They should have received his judgment, but they didn't. They sought mercy. So remember that when you're thinking prosperity gospel and everything's going great because I'm doing this, reading my Bible and, and praying. Are you living like Christ in this world? Maybe you remember the reading uh, that was from last Saturday. There isn't much recorded about Jeroboam II, but we see that he was evil, and yet God used him. That's when you read those verses. He was an evil king, but God showed mercy through him to his unfaithful, adulterous people. Wow. What a gracious, loving God who keeps his covenants, keeps his promises. And he sent his son to die for us. So how much more does he expect us to live as a holy, set-aside people? Man, that feels refreshing, doesn't it? To know that the hand of God is for us rather than against us. So this week you read about Isaiah. We started reading Isaiah. Yeah, you've read about Isaiah before. And there's so much controversy about Isaiah. Many people think since there's so many things of prophecy in there that obviously speak of Jesus Christ that it had to be written after the fact. But if you know anything from, from history again, that when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found a complete copy of Isaiah in there that dated back but well before Christ. Isaiah gives, gives so many prophecies. But, you know, some of them haven't come true yet. Notice I said yet. See, the sign of a prophet is that whatever he says comes true because it comes from God. So if it hasn't come true, it's because it hasn't come true yet. So Jesus Christ will reign on the throne in Israel. Called a millennial kingdom. We'll get to that spoiler alert. But Jesus Christ will come back and reign and he will come to you and make your works accountable to him Isaiah starts out this way in Isaiah 1 the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah Jotham Ahaz and Hezekiah kings of Judah we've got a time frame okay we've got facts from history we know that these are historical events that took place not just fairy tales, but they are truth. We don't need archaeology to tell us that Nineveh existed. We know it's true because it's in the Bible. We don't know what kind of fish swallowed Jonah, but it happened because he was a real person. That's why I brought the verses out from Kings. He was a real prophet. This was not a fishy story. 
Okay? He was a real man of God <laughs> that set a pretty bad example of what a man of God should be like, right? But when I read about him, then it makes me look in a mirror and see all my shortcomings and how I pointed my finger at other people and say, they don't deserve your mercy and grace. When I see the, all the ones pointing back at me saying, I didn't deserve your mercy or grace. So we have a time frame here and we're in 790 to 690 B.C. is where we're at. Isaiah 1, verses 2 through 5 says, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox, it knows its master. The donkey knows its owner's manger. Now, here's where you can be confused. I thought the Lord was burning in a manger, and we see this building. The manger's the feeding trough, okay? So that saying, the donkey knows who feeds him. The ox knows who his master is. But Israel, the children of God, do not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you pursue persist in rebellion you know just reading that sounds like it's coming close to the end that God's fed up but he continues to show love mercy and grace why why does he do that that all that will be drawn to him will be drawn to him what a compassionate God well let's read on and you might notice you might have noticed in your readings there's a, a ter term in there uh, NIV uses Lord Almighty if you're reading King James, it says, Lord of hosts. The NLT says, Lord of heaven's armies. That explains it a little better. Because the NIV really falls short when it says, Lord Almighty. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 1, verses 9 to 13. So we're just a little bit in the book. Unless the Lord Almighty okay, has left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been, been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lamb of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts, where justice takes place, right? Stop bringing me these meaningless offerings. Are some of the times that we give to God, it's giving Him off the bottom instead of off the top? I'll do this, but I won't do that. Would you classify them as meaningless to Him? If your heart is not fully committed to Him, then your sacrifices are meaningless. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, and convulsions, I get it out, kind of. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies when you come together. Now let me go back to that Lord Almighty before we go on any further. Lord of hosts, King James says, or Lord of heaven's armies. What that means is Lord, Jehovah, God, second word in Hebrew, has a vast army, un unnumberable, of angelic beings at his commands. Let me remind you of that. When one angel shows up, people drop down in fear of dead and try to worship them. And I'll give you, you know, tons of other examples. When one angel, and the, the, it sounds like thunder and, earth and the ground shakes, that's when one angel shows up. And Jehovah God, the God of Israel, the God who is the Father of Jesus Christ our Lord, has a army of angelic beings at his command. It's a wonder that we have not been utterly destroyed for our disobedience. Wow, what a loving, merciful God who has brought you back from the gates of hell by the precious blood of his only son, Jesus Christ. To live with your light shining before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What does your worship look like? Is it meaningless? 
Are you worshiping the Lord your God, the host of angelic armies? The book goes on. We're still in the first chapter. Verse 18 says, Come now, let us settle this matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Sounds like Jesus. <laughs> There's hope. God loves me so much that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but instead have everlasting life. So I asked you this question when we started. Who will I send? That's the name of this message. <laughs> We've got an example of Jonah. We've got an example of Isaiah so far. Let's read some in the New Testament about where we fit into this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death? Is that where it ends? Or is there so that, that ties it together, so that we may do this, serve the living God the host of angelic armies who has decided to give us life instead of death by sacrificing his son instead of sacrificing us. Wow. Go to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 10, starting verse 8. For he said, sacrifices and burnt offerings and sin offerings you not, not desire. Didn't we just read something simple, similar? Nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, priests stand and perform his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made per perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. That we're cleansed from the red blood of Jesus to be made white as snow. And where, there ha where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Christians, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, nothing keeping us from God, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is His body. And since we have a great high priest, over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith, faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and doing that all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. That's why I want you to read. That's why I want to reward you now so you can say, oh, oh yeah, okay. Let me live a life of worth. Let me study God's word. Let me hunger and thirst for righteousness. May I not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That I teach my children when I get up, when I go to bed, when I sit down, when I have a meal, when I have free time, what, whatever it is. That I talk about the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and our God, our Father in heaven. That we can come to Him and cry, Daddy, thank you. We love you by His Spirit. Is the Old Testament now kind of putting some light on the New Testament? You know, we tend to forget the Old Testament, but you're not going to start the New Testament until October. <laughs> That's how much meat is in the Old Testament. Let me remind you again that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's talking about the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet. It was being written. 
So they were studying the Old Testament, all these things. He said, oh, man, this list of kings. Whew! But look at it through the lens of Christ and a gracious God who loves you so much. Another verse from the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. They're temporal. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. It's eternal. As you're reading through Kings and through these things again and seeing the words of Isaiah, his message was not a good one to the children of Israel. But yet it was because he said, repent. And he said, a Savior will come from your midst. But for now, because of your obedience, you will pay the price. You will be conquered. You will be taken from the land that I have promised you. Because I told you if you were faithful, you would stay in that land. But you haven't been. But there's still hope. Because from you, from that stump, the root of Jesse will rise up. Jesus Christ will come. And he will reign. So have you been purchased back to God through the blood of Christ? And are you fulfilling that great commission for your life? Let's go back to Isaiah one more time. We'll move on a few chapters. Isaiah 6. In the year King Uzziah died, so we've got a time frame, 740 B.C., I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is, the NIV uses Lord Almighty. King James uses the Lord of hosts. NLT uses the Lord of heavenly armies. Here are these heavenly beings and we get a glimpse into heaven that are worshiping God. If they're worshiping God and the ground trembles and men fall faint as dead before them, then are you and I worshiping God? They say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their vo voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. We get that in there again, and don't forget that Jesus says woe to so many who think they're righteous. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, because I got a glimpse of God. For I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Just because I've seen him, I will, I'm sure I, I will be utterly destroyed. For who am I except a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips? Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. And maybe yours has Isaiah's commission as a title and subtitle, whatever, next. And here's Isaiah's response from that. And remember, we've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, not by a coal from the altar, okay? Not by an angel, but by the Lord God Almighty Himself who became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Isaiah's commission. And who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. That was his response. Wasn't like Jonah's, was it? It was, send me. I have seen the Lord Almighty, the host of angelic armies, and lived. Of course I will serve you. He didn't see Jesus Christ die for him. How much more should we serve him? He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. That's not the message we have either. We have the message of God's love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, we have such a message of hope to carry. Where Isaiah's message was God's judgment's coming on you. But there's still hope. There's still hope for your children and everything because God is faithful. 
but we have the message of Jesus Christ, God's Son, died for your sins. You can have hope in this world who, which has so gone astray. There's another example I want to give you. His name's Saul. You know him as Paul. In Acts 26, verse 16 to 18, he tells of his commission. He says, Now get up and stand on your feet, is what the Lord Jesus said. I have appeared to you and appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have been, seen and will see of me. This is Paul telling King Agrippa, the earthly king, no coincidence here, that could destroy him, who had the authority to kill his life. Remember that, what Jesus says? But instead he feared the one who had the authority to not only kill him, but to cast his soul into eternity of hell. So Paul boldly told of his commission to this earthly king. Verse 17, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by my faith in me. See the commission of Paul, of Saul, who stood before an earthly king and said, I won't fear you because I fear the Lord Almighty. And he has redeemed me, for so therefore I have nothing to fear. That perfect love is, is there which casts out all fear because I have a Father in heaven that I can call upon. Wow. Are you getting the whole story? So let's go back to that reluctant prophet named Jonah. You know I had to talk about him. He's a thing of Sunday school lessons because it's such a big tale, isn't it? How can this guy get swallowed by a fish? And, but we forget to mention how reluctant he was so many times. We talk about the fish, and we talk about Nineveh repenting, but we don't talk about God using this message that didn't even mention his name to a reluctant prophet who said, I am not going to that people because they don't deserve your mercy. And I know if I go, and I'm going to pout about it, if you've read it, I'm not in control of anything, but I'm going to pout about it because I don't want them to see mercy. I want Israel. And thinking, that's why I set up the tone for this, he had already been to the king and told Israel that they were going to gain control of their land and rebuild and grow. If I go take this message to my enemy, then they might just destroy me still. I don't know what they'll do. This doesn't play into my reasonable thinking. If you want to give me a message like Isaiah and say that I will destroy you and no mercy is available, and that's the one I'm going to give. Isn't that what he gave? Because that's not what he was told to give. Let, let's look at what he was told to give. Jonah 1, verses 1 to 3. The, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amidi, same Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has, wickedness has come before me. Now, Whenever God does that, there's always promises because he warns and warns and warns until when? That day of judgment. So even though it's not written there, there is still hope. But when that day of judgment comes, you won't have a chance to witness to your neighbor anymore. You won't have a chance to witness to your children anymore, your wife, your relatives. It will be too late then. There's no do-overs. As long as that message is still there, even though hope's not written in there, there's still hope and we're called to be the messengers of hope and reconciliation. Verse 3, but Jonah away, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. I'll deliver your message as long as it's what I want to deliver, as long as it fits in my plans. Hmm, I'm guilty of saying that. Maybe you're not, but I am. I'll, I'll admit it. And I'm guilty of saying, I'll go to this person, <laughs> but I don't want to go to that person. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty of that. But how could a prophet boldly refuse his calling and commission from God? How could I, a man of unclean lips, when I've seen God give his son Jesus Christ for me 
ever say I'll do it conditionally or I won't do it or anything else. Shouldn't I say, here I am, Lord, send me? If you didn't read Jonah, read it. If you did read it and you didn't get convicted, just smacked in the face, read it again. It's only by the grace of God that you have breath, that you have life, that you have one little bitty tree to give you a little warmth. And then if God takes it, or a little coolness from the, from the heat. And then if God takes it away the next day, who are you to question him? The host of angelic armies who instead of destroying you has called you to repentance. Who has given you a message of hope and reconciliation to the lost world. So let's go to the New Testament and wrap this up. What did Jesus say about Jonah? Hmm. Matthew 12, we read some this morning. Matthew 12, verse 38 to 41. This is a different passage if you're not catching it. Some of the same storyline, though. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, if you notice when Merle read it, he said the crowds were great. We had all these people who wanted to see Jesus and wanted the benefits but didn't want a Lord. Here's the people say, I don't need any salvation. I got it all figured, it out, figured out. I'm giving all these meaningless offerings, <laughs> marking off the boxes. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Here's how Jesus answered. A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given you except the, son, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Real guy, not a fishy story. They knew who he was. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, remember those who repented, will stand up at when? Judgment Day when there is no more chances with this generation and condemn it. Whoa, with this generation, me. I'm in this generation. They'll stand up and con condemn me. Why? Because they repented. At, at Jesus Christ's death, no, they didn't see it. At mighty works of the Lord, no, they didn't see it. They simply heard 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And even the king commanded that even the animals repent. Wow! <laughs> For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here, the Son of God. Let me read it again to you, but read it with my modern translation. If you've read the message before, then this is really a message. Okay? Then some, oh, but thank goodness not all the church and all the Christians, <laughs> they want to see G Jesus, but they want to tempt him by asking, did he really mean what he said? Can I not just listen to your words and not do them? Is that not somewhere in your teachings? Surely it is. Surely this doesn't apply to me. But Jesus answered, Oh, you wicked and adulterous servant, this church, this body of Christ of mine, they asked for a sign instead of obeying me. But none will be given them except for the prophet of Jonah. Do you remember how he disobeyed me? But still my will was done through him. In fact, more grace and mercy was shown because the men from all over the world that were on that ship, they saw the true God. When Jonah came to the shoreline, do you think no one saw him be spit up out of that well? What do you think he looked like? Bleached white like he was about half dead? but yet he went on to where I told him to go. And it's funny, the town is called House of the uh, Fishes in the House. When he came into town, <laughs> people noticed him. He didn't even have to proclaim anything because they already seen an act of God spit this man out on the shore that looked like he was dead. We better listen up to this guy. And I had prepared their hearts and minds. All he had to do was go like I told him. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, I vomited him up, but to do my will again, not for destruction, because he was my servant, my child, the one to proclaim my message, my name, my glory, my will be done 
not his. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> That's the message he thought he could do to stop my grace and mercy from being spread. He went in the opposite direction. Let me remind you again. And I brought him back to, to, to the right direction and I spread mercy and grace and God's love all along the way. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Me, God himself, dying for you. Do you really believe? Do you hear and obey? Are you a child of God? If not, the men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something much, much, much greater than he is here. My sheep hear my voice and listen to it, and they come in and out and find shade and pasture and rest for their very souls. And I am with them, and nothing can separate them from the love of God that comes through me. Now, that's my version. <laughs> but that's what Jesus said. He said, look back at Jonah. Do you remember how I used him? I am going to bring the whole world to repentance, even through your disobedience. Merle read the passage from Luke. So let me read before and after that. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is Luke eleven twenty nine 29 and 33, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Ah, we've got another example. The Queen of the South will rise at judgment with the people of this generation and condemn it. Same thing, repent or die. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Wisdom, fear of the Lord, to love only Him, to let the Lord direct your paths, to not acknowledge your own wisdom, your own insight, but to lean and trust on Him with all of your understanding. Okay, And now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Aha! So here's what you should do. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, very, very, truly, truly, listen up. They put it on a stand so that those who come it come and may see the light. This is what Jesus Christ was speaking to them before he ever laid down his life. Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. There is no middle ground. See, he kept on. That's why I'm reading you the verses before and afterwards. Whoever does not gather with me, they scatter. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander, that, that can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So, all right, here, let me make it worse for you. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's ever said, go to that neighbor that I don't like and reconcile with him. Whew, I'll stop there. Verse 33. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by my words you will be acquitted, and by my words you will be condemned. See, now I let, instead of me just saying it, I read you those words in red. So you can know that I wasn't just saying that, that it's there in the scripture. And if you read on, it says, while Jesus was still asking was still talking to the crowd, his mothers and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. 
He replied to them, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, those that have forsaken all to follow after him, who gave up their fishing nets to be fishers of men, he said to them, Here are my bro mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Who will I send? We've all been commissioned by Jesus Christ to be a light to this world. I hope you take that commission seriously. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a God of mercy. We thank you for Jonah's witness to us, even in his reluctance and disobedience, how you used him to bring repentance to a nation who so much did not deserve it. <laughs> and to us, individuals who do not deserve your grace, but you have lavishly poured it out upon us. And besides just pouring out your mercy, you have continued to pour out grace upon grace upon grace that we should be called the children of God. May we worship you, not with just meaningless sacrifices marking off boxes, but may we worship you with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And may we love one another, as Jesus said, for all the law of the prophets point to this, that you love even your enemies and want to draw them to you. Help us be the light to this world that you have called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.